Hi there, this is Victor Cook, the executive producer and supervising director of Stretch Armstrong and the Flex Fighters, which you can watch on Netflix. I was also the producer and supervising director of The Spectacular Spider-Man, and I want to wish all the fans of that show a happy 10-year anniversary. You are watching Neil Before Pod. Neil Before Blog presents... Neil Before Pod. Hello and welcome to a Cretaceous edition of Neil Before Pod, the podcast that bred raptors. I'm your host Craig and with the upcoming release of Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom, as well as the 25th anniversary of the release of the iconic first film, it's time for Neil Before Pod to have a conversation about it and its impact on all of us. To do this, I've spared no expense in calling in the finest experts that money can buy to help endorse this podcast, get me through this conversation and escape the blood-sucking lawyer. First up we've got someone who doesn't look very scary, more like a six-foot turkey, it's Chris. Hello. Hello. And secondly, we have someone who has come back. He came back after the Flash podcast, surprisingly. Um, No one's more glad than I am. But Andrew, Andrew, we've got Andrew here. Hello there. Yes, and I I, I assure you, it is actually me. Craig hasn't cloned me or anything like that. (laughs) It's all part of the miracle of cloning. (laughs) That's well. That, that's how I get all my stuff done. The miracle cloning. Yes, but you, but you wouldn't want to think about which, uh, which body fluids he uses no. to get that done. Let's not. Let's not go there. Yeah. The only problem with there being two of me is you have to feed two of me, which is quite expensive. <laughs> I tried starving the other one, but you know, he didn't like that. So yeah. Uh, so we're here to talk about a film that is 25 years old. If it was a real, if it was a person, it would be old enough to adopt a child in most places anyway. I think that's the legal limit. I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with this. Uh, Neither do we. Yeah, that was a very odd analogy. It was, but it's old enough to do things. That, that was where I was going. But before we do that, we're going to do our, our hit new feature with one listener who said that they liked it and thought it was a good idea. Uh, Yay! Result! Yeah, our Neil Before Rise Against feature, where we pick something that we've experienced recently that's both good and bad. Not the one thing being both good and bad, that's just really abstract, but we pick one good thing, one bad thing. So I'm going to randomly select Chris to go first. Oh, excellent. Okay, so I am uh, kneeling before... Uh, on this episode uh, the new Fallout 76 trailer, a little teaser trailer uh, that arrived this week. It looks rather cool I enjoyed Fallout 4 and playing that so uh, really looking forward to playing a bit more Fallout. Why have they jumped from 4 to 76? Because reasons. <laughs> oh, and why is it called 76? Do you know? Um, it is named after the vault number. Ah. The vault, so it's Vault uh, 76 that's going to feature in this, which is apparently a, a a control vault. So anyone that plays any of the uh, Fallout games will know that each of the vaults, or the majority of the vaults, were all weird experiments. Okay. My favourite one being a vault where a single man went in and found out that his only company were puppets. <laughs> um, so what they did is they scattered these control vaults around that were basically, these are the ones that we didn't experiment on and everything went absolutely fine, in theory. And then you would compare the vault with the man in a room full of puppets to the vault <laughs> with normal people in who were acting in a standard way. So that's that's sort of the little hint that we've had so far. Uh, not really much information's come out. It's very much a little teaser. There's no gameplay or anything in it, uh, but more information to come at uh, E3. I haven't seen this teaser yet. I'm not a huge fan of the Fallout games, though. It seems like it seems like it'll t- they'll take a lot of time, and I don't have a lot of time. So, if if someone tells me that a game is going to take me about eight hours to complete, I'm instantly like, nah, that's not happening. Yeah, I'm, I yearn for the days of being 13 years old and uh, doing nothing with a weekend other than playing video games. Those were the days. Oh, just do one less podcast a week and you can use that as your gaming time. <laughs> no, because I'd feel guilty. I feel like I was... I don't know. I'm going to play games over the summer, though, so that's going to happen. 
Oh, excellent. Have you, have you got a pile sitting there waiting to go? No, no, I'll just see what's going on. Um, so yeah, Fallout 76. I can't really comment much on it. I've not seen the teaser. I saw that it existed, but I haven't seen it. Cool. I'm going to go second, and I'm kneeling before something that's relevant to the subject that we're talking about today. Jeff Goldblum is releasing a jazz album. <laughs> wow. And we all know we're buying it. It's a foregone conclusion. It's Jeff Goldblum and a jazz album. Need I say any more? Oh, arena tour, surely. Arena tour. That's, that's the more that needs to be said, is, and he's playing an arena tour. Oh, I mean, Edinburgh great. Jazz Festival is coming up, so, this you know, true. Jeff, if you're listening, I'm sure they could find a space for you. And uh, you're welcome on the podcast any time. Oh, yeah, you and Ryan Reynolds. We are the podcast well, that Ryan well, Reynolds turned down. Well, I'd go to the, the I say turned down, he ignored. Or didn't reply. I'm going to so say... Far. So far. So far. Yeah. So far. So, Ryan, still waiting for that answer. If you can talk to Chris Hewitt on the Empire Podcast, you can talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, that's it. Jazz and Jeff Goldblum. A great combination. Andrew, what are you kneeling before today? Oh, I am currently kneeling before Troll Hunters, uh, which is a, a CG animated uh, series on Netflix, uh, which which recently released its third and final, very very final season. Um, it's um it's a it's a fantasy series about uh, about about a teenage boy who. Um, who is chosen by a uh, biscal amulet to to wield to wield the power of the troll hunter, uh, which 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 involves defend which involves defending defending troll kind against uh, against all, all sorts of all sorts of monsters and, and darkness that threatens it, and and just listening to myself actually say that I might make it sound really 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 bad, um, <laughs> but, I, but I assure you it is actually brilliant. And the the first two seasons of it were I, I were were all, were all all part of like uh, one overall overall story, but were 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 fairly episodic in in themselves. But but this one it was it was effectively a four four and a half hour serialized film, and it was absolutely magnificent. And, and I watched the entire thing in a single sitting, which really wasn't too advisable because I started watching it at about at about ten o'clock at night. Yeah, so the the next day was not fun. But the the whole thing, like it was, like, it, it was it was exciting. It was it was funny. It was uplifting. It, uh, it was um, I just like all the, all the emotions. Generally speaking, I, mean, I don't I generally don't react to. Uh, to a huge emotion, emotional extent when um, when watching films or TV, but yeah, but basically, basically, well, this one was just like really hitting me right in the feels, and I am always surprised when when something manages to do that. But I was always surprised, surprised in a pleasant way, and and if anybody actually, um, hasn't come across the series yet, I would highly recommend it. Is this the thing that Guillermo del Toro produces? It is, yes. No, the other, yeah, he's involved in this one. Um, it, it's actually uh, based based on a children's book, with, uh, which he which he co-authored. All oh, right, and it's no relation to the Troll Hunter film, that Norwegian. It's not no, no. It just just happens to have a similar name. Fair enough. Sounds cool. Um, it's something that I'm aware of and will check out at some point. I like Definitely. the Toro stuff, so this is um, this is something I'll, I'll have a look at. Sounds like one for the Netflix queue. Indeed, that queue that just never gets watched. Yeah, because <laughs> you watch old episodes of Friends instead. <laughs> or that's just me. No. Um, I don't watch old episodes of Friends anymore. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Anyway, uh, Chris, you went first on Neil before. So rise against. What are you rising against? So I am rising against a bit of news that I read online and I was like, do you know what, I'm going to save that for a rise against. Idris Elba to star, direct and produce Netflix's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> why, is why is this even a, a thing? thing? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, why is this a thing? Why, why does it need to be all these things that are getting remade now? What, what is with live action 
and coming along and going, ah, we're just going to do another version of this one. Uh, now, granted, granted, this is a Netflix one. It's a Netflix thing. It's not a Disney thing. Yeah. Uh, that I could have a whole separate rant about. <laughs> but, yes, uh, we're getting a live-action hunt back, Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, I did read about this. I've not. I don't really have an opinion either way. I do like Idris Elba. That's enough for me to have a look at it. Eh, I suppose I don't know. I suppose it's not earth-shattering news as such, but eh, Idris Elba. I don't know. He's cool enough. Um, the Hunchback story can be quite dark as well. I mean, a lot of the stories that Disney have picked up are really dark in origin, so could go down that route. But, but you don't like it. You you think it's a bad idea. Doesn't sound like a great idea. Fair enough. The, the, this is actually the the first that I've I've heard about it, surprisingly. Oh. Um, and I'll, I'm I'm fi- I'm finding like the the concept is esoteric enough to pique my interest. But yeah, I'm not convinced it's something that needs to exist. Yeah, I suppose anything can be like that until you actually see it and then it proves itself worthy. But yeah. I I think that there's almost no such thing as a bad idea, uh, but bad execution is is what mostly happens. Of course, there are some things that are just really bad ideas, which I won't really go into. I Am Rising Against, the Crow remake, is dead again, and I think it's more dead than it ever has been. Uh, Is this this, still going on? This came out a couple hours ago, so it's fresh off the boil. Um, a couple of hours ago as of this recording as of when publishing it's really old news but uh, Jason Momoa who only recently signed up he's gone and the director Corin Hardy also gone so he's the guy that's been working on this thing for years <laughs> and he is he's gone um, yeah they left apparently they left the project because of creative and financial differences which is never good so there we go. Um, that's not happening. <laughs> I kind of wanted to see it, and I like Jason Momoa, so we're not going to get to see it, I guess. Or if we do, it will be one of these situations where, yeah, we're just going to make this, and they're probably going to give it to Colin Trevorrow. <laughs> no, because that guy's good, right? <laughs> yes, his, his track record is positively impeccable. <laughs> He's made, what, one okay film? A couple of dreadful films. I, I just like the, the headlines. Uh, the crow has its wings clipped again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, okay, that's good. Yeah. So, someone earned their degree with that one. Yeah, go, go for it, headline writer. <laughs> yeah. It's not clickbait either. <laughs> okay. Andrew, what are you rising against? Right, I am rising against the recent announcement that Zack Snyder is going to be adapting uh, 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 adapting uh, no, uh, no, uh, a novel, novel named The Fountainhead and uh, uh, this is one of the, one of the novels uh, uh, by Ayn Rand who's, uh, who's the, a, a, a German philosopher who uh, f- famous for for developing objectivism uh, which which is a uh, kind of moral philosophy um, for people who think that, li- that libertarians are are, uh, are are soft hippie pussies, and not wishing to uh, to, to to spend too to, uh, too long ranting about about my, about my issues with objectivism itself. Uh, just uh, just the but just taking the fountainhead by itself. In it, and out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of novels that, that I've read throughout my life, The Fountainhead is the second worst one of them. <laughs> second, second only to the tepid puddle of afterbirth that is Battlefield Earth. <laughs> I, I assume that, assume that, like the that you that you will have seen the. The the film version of Battlefield Earth. Oh yes. Yeah. Well, in in comparison to it to its source novel, um, it's it's a positive work of art. <laughs> and and Fountainhead is all 
almost as bad as that, which it is. Um, it's effectively about uh, about an ar- an architect who is who is crit- who is criticised for, for his new and radical ideas, um, uh, and as. Uh, and and is and is shunned by his peers for just not following what's gone before. It basically exists as for Rand to use the characters as mouthpieces for her philosophical views and contra- contrasts them uh, against strawman parodies of collectivism and socialism, which is just as painful to to read as it sounds. After the notification of it, uh, one one of the other guys who writes for Starburst. Uh, uh, commented that from the from the director of of, of a film which fe- featured a, a plot point of a jar of piss comes the adaptation of, of a novel which is the literary equivalent of a jar of piss. <laughs> <laughs> and also comparing the characters in the novel to Snyder himself, in I can't I can't help but speculate. I think that, like the the extent to which he he relates to, to to a man who is portrayed as a misunderstood visionary who could inspire the world the world to greatness if only the unthinking man could appreciate his singular world view. <laughs> How much opportunity is there for slow mo in there? Not a great deal, um, unless there's uh, great sweeping vistas of the imagined ar- architectural creations. It'll be fine when um, when he steps down and Joss Whedon has to finish it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of have the feeling that I want to watch it now, just out of morbid curiosity after your sales pitch. There must be an audience for it, otherwise they wouldn't be making it. Yeah, well, yeah, well, well actually, well, the, 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 well, it, it, it was actually uh, uh, adapted previously, uh, sometime in, in the 40s, I think. As is generally the case when, when, ad- when adapting a, a worthless book, it resulted in a worthless film. Fair enough. So, not liking it. That's, that's the summary. Um, I know nothing about it, I've not read the book. Um, but, I don't know. I don't mind Zack Snyder. It could be one of those things where it's an adaptation in name only kind of thing I don't know uh, I'll put the summary of the book in the show notes for people to read it including me because I'm not going to read the book but I'll read the summary of it Spark Notes version you know that, that thing that got me through university sometimes <laughs> so now on to the main event that 25 year old film that film that is old enough to do things uh, we're here to talk about Jurassic Park possibly one of the finest blockbusters ever made even to this day Released in 1993, directed by Steven Spielberg, starring Sam Neill, Jeff Goldblum, Laura Dern, and some other people. Richard Attenborough. Yeah, Dickie Attenborough. Yeah, the brother of David Attenborough, who, who is the voice of nature. Let's do the thing where we don't spoil it, because people might not have seen this 25-year-old cultural touchstone. So... Chris, you can go first. What do you think of Jurassic Park? It's an absolute classic, isn't it? I mean, I don't think you can say much more than that. And if you haven't seen it, and you're listening to our spoiler-free section to decide if you want to see it or not, go and see it. (laughs) We've saved you a time there. Off your pop. Um, No, it's uh, a classic film. It's just one that you remember from the the second you watch it, really. Yeah, same for me. Classic, it's iconic, memorable just really well directed pioneering in visual effects everything, everything just comes together and make this amazing uh, Andrew, what do you think? Yeah, I'm in complete agreement, uh, the film is absolutely magnificent um, Yeah, I honestly have no idea the number of times that, that I've rewatched it, I, uh, I only do know that, that the only film that I've rewatched more times is The Goonies <laughs> Everything about about the film is put together beautifully, and it's two hours long. But even even as a kid, uh, yeah, that, that that felt like nothing. But just because every time that, that I watched it, I was just completely completely taken taken into into it as if it was the first time. Yeah, yeah, I would agree there. It's yeah, it's the wonder of cinema. You know, the people use that phrase so often, but it truly is. It's just this. It's an experience, and I think. Um, modern generations are missing out on, on possibly something as great as this um, you know when all they get is Jurassic World is maybe their introduction to the franchise uh, I feel sorry for those people that start but, but if it encourages them to look back at some of this then it can only be a good thing maybe yeah that's true so shall we let the spoiler dinosaur roar the spoilersaurus spoilersaurus I like that yeah let's go for the spoilersaurus <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
okay, we're now free to spoil this 25 year old film. So that, that really dodged the bullet there. Really on the pulse, you know. Some people are worried about Infinity War being spoiled. It came out a month ago, and, but we're not going to be the ones that spoil Jurassic Park for you without warning you we're going to do it. Be privileged, audience. Be privileged. So, just kind of start with the story. Um, the story is that a crazy rich guy wants to build a theme park that features dinosaurs as the attractions. It's like a zoo or a safari park, but with dinosaurs. Such a novel idea. And funnily enough, it was adapted from a novel. Uh, that, was, that was accidental, but there we go. Uh, so, yeah, so John Hammond, Richard Attenborough, our, uh, our, our fine Scottish specimen who spares no expense, invites a collection of scientists and a lawyer to come and look at the park over a weekend. And of course, all hell breaks loose, because otherwise it would be a really boring film if they were just running around being like, these are amazing, and then they all endorse the park. So, <laughs> <laughs> I would love the alternate cut of them all just turning up going, wow, this is great. Oh, we had such a good time. Oh, I'm definitely going to endorse this. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we'll open next summer. Thanks, guys. <laughs> yeah. Cheers. Thanks for your it's, endorsement. Yeah. It's a good job that no dinosaurs broke out and started killing people. That was really good. That would have been horrible. Yeah. Um, it was adapted from a book. I'm not going to talk too much about the book because I hate all this kind of but in the book they do this sort of stuff but this this is very different to the book you know it's it's two different experiences reading them uh, reading this and reading the book and then watching this film you know different characters behave differently and, and events play out differently and and all this stuff so that's a different characters all. die different characters die yeah including some that are alive in the sequel um, and important in the sequel but I'm not going to, that's all I'm going to say about the book because there's not much, you know, I'm not going to sit here and compare it. Uh, Michael Crichton, who wrote the book, helped with the screenplay on this film, which is kind of rare um, for, for film adaptations of stuff. Usually this, the author is about as far away as they can be, but Spielberg seemed to be content to work with him to create something new. So that's good. Well, as I mentioned in in the in the spoiler free section, the story is constructed from uh, mo mo from multiple aspects. There is the park itself and the visiting scientists in, in inspecting it, and the, the corporate espionage going on behind behind the scenes from the stereotypical computer nerd Nedry. I love that guy. So yes, I'm sure I'm sure we'll return to him later with, with him being paid to steal the, the dinosaur embryos, and even uh, and even right at the very beginning, where where there was a worker killed by what by uh, uh, raptor, um, which is which is how the scientists uh, c come to inspect the, par the park in the first place. Even even though the story is a, is a co is a coalescence of of all all of, all of these aspects, like it, it just feels like like it it all comes comes together naturally. That like it it like, it, it, do it doesn't feel the, the slightest slightest bit contrived. Even 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 though if if anyone any one of of a number of things ha hadn't occurred, then then the whole story w w just wouldn't have taken place. Or when they played out in the same way that it did. One thing I always find striking is um, how my perception of this film has changed as I've gotten older. So when I was younger, you know, when I watched it when it came out, I was well, it was ninety three, so I was like five or something, um, something like that. And you know, it's although I didn't get my first experience of it until it was on video. For some reason, my parents wouldn't take me to the cinema, and that's why we don't talk anymore. No. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Now, if, if parents are listening, I do still talk to them, of course. It's all right. Uh, they're not listening. They're not listening. No, of course not. <laughs> why, why would they listen? They don't talk to me. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when when you're younger, you know, it's it's almost like watching. It's the same effect The Simpsons has on you as you kind of grow up as well. So you watch it in, it in its kind of purest form, where it's like, oh, dinosaurs, oh, cool stuff, you know, oh, like scary stuff and and then as you get older you start to listen to the philosophical debate that's ha being had in the background whereas you know when you're like five or six years old it's uh, it's the boring talkie scene hurry up with the t-rex but the way they present these philosophical issues about resurrecting 65 million year old dinosaurs is fascinating and everyone has an opinion and everyone's opinion is right because it is backed up by you know by their established expertise so it's not one of these things where the debate is no no it's wrong to do this or it's right to do this although 
generally speaking, since they, every film is about them getting eaten by these creations, <laughs> it's very much, I probably shouldn't have done this. Um, and that's something that is kind of lacking in Jurassic World, which will probably come a bit too later, but in Jurassic World there's a much more black and white ethical debate going on, you know, where Vincent D'Onofrio is like, look at me, I'm evil, I want to use these dinosaurs to hunt terrorists and stuff, and that's wrong. But in this it's, we shouldn't have done this. Yeah, we should. You know, of course we should have. And um, it's the fact that in another film, or in another type of film, John Hammond could be the villain because he's the one that has no humility. Uh, his own hubris is kind of the, the antagonist here, but um, in this film, it's no, he's, he's a guy that wants to do the right thing. He's a guy that he's a bit too optimistic and very passionate about what he wants to do, and he kind of makes a few mistakes because he cuts corners, but he's not a bad person, and I find that, I find that interesting. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I've got to be honest. I I rewatched it very recently, and I had almost forgot how it opened with the the raptor attack. Shoot! You know, get, and, yeah. Shoot. <laughs> um, I almost forgot that, and and I'm like, and then I remember as a kid, it was like it was quite a scary opening scene. There's this box getting sent it in, and I think you know what an opening for a film. But yeah, I, I do you know what it means so much more to you when you're able to understand the arguments that are at play in the background and sort of John Hammond as a character, you go sort of mad Willy Wonka character that wanted to create a dinosaur theme park, yeah. you know, and you're going, oh my god, you know, it was like, well, I, I, I can bring them back to life, why not? And let's make it a theme park because why not? And as much as you've got the your sort of lawyer sitting there going, imagine how much money we're going to make. We're going to charge thousands of pounds per second just for people to be here. And he's sitting there going, no, we're going to let people come in if they want to come in, and we're going to let, you know. It's it's got to be open for everyone, you know. I, 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 I kind of like that it wasn't just a, a money scheme. It seems that I've made my money elsewhere and I'm, I'm spending it on this passion project. You know, but it's... Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because, like you say, you can fall on both sides of these uh, of the debate and not be wrong. You know, his argument is well, if there's you know if there's a pandas, for example, if pandas are going extinct, I think he uses the example of a, a particular bird, but let's condors. go with condors. Yeah. yeah. So he goes condors. If condors are are going extinct, why not use this technology I've created to bring back condors? You'd be okay for that. And it's like, well, yeah, yeah, it'd be all right, because that's, you know, it's our fault that the condors are going out, but it wasn't our fault the dinosaurs came out. And you go, well, actually, yeah, they're both right. There's not, you know, there's not particularly wrong. Like you say, the park goes into a bit of chaos, but not necessarily because of what they've done. You know, it's... I, I think something that I can bring up later on is the amount of stupidity and people having to make stupid decisions in order for things to go wrong, which applies, I think, throughout all these films uh, up to Jurassic World. You know, you could have as many fail safes and everything as you like, but if people don't hit the buttons on the fail safes, then it doesn't make any difference. Um, you know, so it's, you know, as much as the life finds a way argument is said very often, I always say you know sort of stupidity seems to find a way <laughs> on these on these things you know yeah they'll leave the gate open they'll switch off the electric fence and they won't you know they won't come to obvious conclusions quick enough yeah yeah although it's kind of it's interesting how they kind of talk hint that they rushed into this so they didn't i mean ian malcolm goldblum's character says that the knowledge didn't take any discipline to attain it so the the whole example of they're using amphibian DNA, specifically frogs, to you know to to round out the gene sequence gaps so that the the missing DNA would would work, you know, the, so the dinosaur would would function. Um, they no one considered the fact that frogs can change gender apparently at will, and that the dinosaurs might gain that ability. So it's it's these little things, you know, they've got these little examples of just where they haven't quite thought enough through. Um, because they were just so anxious to get the job done. So it's like, okay, we can do this, let's just do it and not think about, let's not do a risk assessment, let's just not think about it. Yes, and just uh, re-watching it uh, uh, before before recording this, it is 
occurred to me that there aren't really any any characters in the film who are truly villains. You have kind of a character like, like Nedry, like who who is just greedy, and as you mentioned earlier, in a different film, Ham, uh, Hammond himself like, would, 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 have been, would have been the villain. And you can't really refer to, uh, to any of the dinosaurs as, as villains characters just because they're, they're basically animals uh, acting according to, the, to their nature. And so really, the the only conflict that, that is generated is, uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, pe- people making stupid decisions and really, really, really bad mistakes. I do agree, it's quite quite unusual for, for, for any film, but in, in particular a blockbuster film, to not have any any kind of clear-cut lines of morality. Yeah, and it's a film that respects its audience in that in that regard. So you you get a collection of relatively complex individuals. I mean, some of them are more complex than others, obviously. Like Nedry, for instance, is quite one-dimensional in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, but he is, you know, he only exists to fulfil a certain purpose, so that's absolutely fine. He's not the main character. But so you've got a collection of complex characters, and then a situation that they're put in that is impossible for them to control, and that's where the drama comes from. But if you compare that to, say, The Lost World, where it's like Hammond's nephew is the villain, and he's clearly the villain, you know, um, in so much that he has that cathartic death at the end, you know, when when they, the T Rex and the child T Rex get their, get its revenge, um, or get their revenge on him, for for example. But um, in Jurassic Park Three kind of doesn't really have a villain either, I suppose, but that's forgettable. Um, yeah, it is interesting. I, th- I think it's um, I think it's really good, and it's one of the reasons it sticks with you because because you do enjoy the the characters reacting to a situation rather than all rallying against some evil force that they have to defeat. I mean, part of the reason it all goes all goes wrong is is that there's a storm, you know, and that's that that's the theme of the film or one of the themes that nature just can't be contained, can't be predicted. So it's it's all nature that they have to fight against. I totally agree with that, both in, in regards like to, to a storm and and also the also the dinosaurs themselves. Because there there aren't any situations in which a human like, like could realistically fight a dinosaur. The most anyone could do is just survive. And that's all that's all, all the characters try to do. It's all that they're capable capable of in any given situation. Yeah. Um and sometimes that's enough. It just is. I mean you have a collection of, of people that just react to stuff that's put in front of them and it's interesting the journey that they take you know like Alan Grant for instance he starts off being the the old school dinosaur expert you know he's digging up a bone that's the first you see of him he hates computers he's just such a luddite apparently Uh, and then he gets to Jurassic Park and he's overwhelmed by the fact that the thing he studied for his entire life is standing in front of him and then by the end of it he's like screw this I'm sick of dinosaurs you know, when they when they try to kill you, it sort of puts you off. But that opening yep. scene, the way he realizes what is there on that island, is pretty incredible. I do like the yeah. fact that they've somehow managed to keep it a secret up until that point. You know, driving in a truck with Jurassic Park and a big dinosaur uh, <laughs> logo on the side of it <laughs> that they didn't know what they were going there to see yet. Um, but that that shot is just incredible um, and of course that's when John Williams score properly kicks in as well that first time yeah. other than the approaching the island music which yes. will haunt you for the rest of your life <laughs> <laughs> mm. also like, uh, about uh, about Grant's um, development throughout the film it's uh, uh, another quite, quite um, interesting um, emotional journey he goes on is is, 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 is with his attitude to, to, towards children, yeah, because it's made very clear at the start of the film that, that he doesn't like kids, and and he's not interested in them at all. Yeah, just seeing seeing like at, at the at the dig site where he, where he takes such relish in, in graphic, graphically explaining to like to, like to, to to a fat little brat exactly how a raptor would kill him. Also, uh, when the tour around the around the, the park starts, and he has no qualms about making it clear just how. Like just how much Tim is irritating him when everything goes wrong and people separated and he and and ends up ends up with 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 Lex and Tim. Yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, then then he, inst- he instinctively protects them, yeah, and is and and spends the entire rest of the film protecting them. Yeah, because it just it just doesn't occur to him to, to do anything else. Unlike the 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 lawyer whose first reaction was to run off and leave them. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of awakens his paternal instinct, which is. 
such a shame when you get to Jurassic Park 3 and you find out he's like still talking about dinosaurs and is unmarried and without kids. <laughs> it's like, alright, so he didn't go through anything apparently. He, you know, this, these events had no effect on him whatsoever. And also quite interested to discover, uh, just last night, was I, uh, when, when I, was, I was watching a film uh, with, with, with my wife Jana and I, co- I, I commented that, that, that to her, uh, uh, him instinctively defending the kids, and then she, she informed me that, that, um, that, that it was exactly that is, is, what made it, is what makes him so hot in the film. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, and funnily enough, he has a similar arc in Hunt for the Builder People. That's right, actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, uh, actually, I've never made that connection, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of people, as honest trailers say, uh, refer to Sam Neill as the guy from Jurassic Park. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, that's where most people will have had their introduction to him. Uh, yeah, Alan was, I think, my favourite character growing up certainly um, in, in more recent years I've come to appreciate the gold bloom more than the Sam Neill but I don't everyone know, appreciates, appreciates the gold bloom yeah totally uh, there's something of an Indiana Jones quality to him because he's wearing a hat and you know I, I kind of made that comparison in, uh, when I was watching it when I was younger because you know they're, they're both guys that wear hats in Spielberg films so they're, they're kind of the same Um also had a toy, an action figure of, of Alan Grant with the, the Jeep. You know, with the, the electric Jeep thing. That was that was the days. <laughs> just merchandising. The very merchandising that the film rails against. It, it's just part of its success, <laughs> weirdly, <laughs> you know. I mean there is an alternate world out there where Sam Neill is Han Solo. <laughs> Isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there is. And I'm not sure I want to see that. <laughs> I was a kid at the time, but like it was, you know, it was a weird comparison to make. But it's just hats. It's not too. It's not too far off, though. You know, it's not too far off at all. You don't see him. Well, no, you see him swinging from stuff. Actually. Yeah, well, maybe he is a lot more like uh, uh, a lot more like Indiana Jones. Than sort of Indiana reluctant Jones. to get involved at first, and then jumps head in eventually. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, he's a good character. Um, I think one of the weaknesses of the film is they don't do enough with his relationship with Ellie. Um, you know, it's it's not even clear that they're in a relationship to begin with. Um, it's kind of almost hinted at, but almost not. But he does get jealous of, of Goldblum. Very jealous. Well, even when Goldblum asks. Yeah. Uh, you know, when uh, you know Malcolm asks... You get a a thing of oh are you together oh right okay I didn't know kind of thing going yeah. on in the jeep. Oh, I think that uh, might be partly to do with it's just uh, uh, when when people are in a relationship for, for quite a long time they tend to have uh, a few a few a few and like overt uh, overt uh, pu- uh, d- 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 Public, 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 public displays of affection as they become like more, more comfortable, comfortable with each other, and not so much like kind of, uh, t- uh, take take each other for granted, but they, but they, they just know, know that they are a couple, like they 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 are, they are together, and and don't feel the need like to make this apparent to everyone all the time. Yeah. Or, or perhaps I'm just over, over overthinking it. Well, that's what we do here. We overthink. I totally agree with you about his use in the sort of third film and the fact that you sort of see that there's not really been any development in between the films, which is a bit of a shame. They kind of sort of dismiss all the changes in this film and erase them, which is a shame. Well, the guy in this film would never in a billion years go back to that island. I mean, I know he goes to a different island, but you, you get you get what I mean. You just don't. You know, there is no, no way in hell you could drag him into another dinosaur-infested island. You know, I think um, I think the proper progression for Alan Grant would be that he's he's working in an office somewhere as far away from dinosaurs as humanly possible. After all this, you know, um, I might be turned off by the the notion of dinosaurs at this point. Although the third film does make an interesting point about these dinosaurs that is brought up again in Jurassic World, the fact that they're not real dinosaurs; they're kind of approximations that are genetically engineered to be what people expect from dinosaurs. Especially if you think about recent developments that suggest that real life dinosaurs were absolutely nothing like what you know the giant reptiles that we've come to imagine the idea that they're all feathered and all this yes stuff. it's like ah oh, that just ruins everything yeah 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 because so, i remember I remember reading like uh, quite some time ago like 
uh, uh, that the the real life velociraptors were basically the size of chickens. Yeah. Yeah, and distinctly unthre- unthreatening. And after I read that, I just, th- I just thought, you know what? I'm just going to completely ignore that. I'm going to, pre- I'm going to, pre- I'm going to pretend this, that I didn't read that. Just let me live in my delusion. I want to live in my delusion. They were going with bits of what the science was at the time, weren't they? And you know, to be fair, I think the way that they've managed to write round it is actually quite interesting. And they go, well, so many people think that they're not feathered that if we if we gave them feathered dinosaur island, they would go, that's not dinosaurs. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting what you've made there, but it's clearly not a dinosaur. Uh, so they would just move on. Yeah. Yeah. The, the the way they handle the science in the film is is interesting and hilarious at the same time. The idea that they would find this many mosquitoes uh, fossilized in amber that have just so happened to have recently fed on a a dinosaur, bef- a particular dinosaur before they were um, preserved, is you know is hilarious in itself. Um, and I love the the bit where they talk about the the techniques they use, like virtual reality displays. That guy with his mad gloves is brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. The latest in future technology. We've got a man with wavy gloves. Because that's <laughs> that's what we need to look at DNA is wavy gloves. If we didn't have that, if we just used the keyboard, it wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. I'm not sure how it helps you map the genome, but, you know, whatever. Maybe it does. Also very sweet, so, uh, Hammond's uh, little video where he's acting against himself on screen. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm yep. assuming he's not doing that for every park visitor that comes in otherwise he's going to be a busy guy was that his plan? Well, his no, sort of um, retirement plan if you, if you listen to the lines uh, the lines could be are reacting to something that could be said by anyone mm. so it's just hello there and you know uh, why am I here? it's like well let me show you first of all I need a drop of blood and at no point does the the John on the screen refer to ah, that's true, actually, the other person yeah. as John so it's fine. It can be anyone. So you could just imagine like a rotation of tour groups with different, with different people leading them, and doing yeah. that bit. And I'm also watching that that sequence. Um, it, it becomes apparent that, that there is actually very very little need for for that for, for actual for actual uh, live speaking person to even to even be there. Yeah, be, be, because the part that they play in the presentation is quite negligible. Yeah, although I guess Hammond wants the theatricality. And he wants it to look like it's an interactive experience. So it, it fits with his character that he would want it to be that. But could you imagine, you have someone that works there for like a few months and they just get so bored with it. They, they just kind of say the lines and don't bother like being enthusiastic at all. You could see that happening. Yeah, 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 well, yeah well, actually, uh, reading, reading some accounts of... Uh um, of of people who who work in 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 theme parks, in, in that that does seem, seem seem to be the general consensus. Yeah, yeah, yeah because just uh, of, because even even if you even if you're surrounded by this sort of magic and wonder, I, I, um, uh, every, every single day. I mean, I mean after after a while, it it, it just gets tedious and repetitive. And you're dealing with the general public. Yeah, people suck. <laughs> <laughs> There's the guy in Jurassic World who manages the hamster balls. And he's like very enjoy your ride, you know, like <laughs> sound like he wants to kill himself. So the, there is that. I mean, it, it would be like that, but um, I can see Hammond just being super excited about it, and he's super excited about everything as well. You know, he has to be there when every dinosaur is born. Although, what's he going to do? Like, I mean, he does a lot of business trips. It seems so. Like, how does he know they're not going to hatch while he's away? I think they just humour him. <laughs> oh, you've arrived just in time again. Thank God. We weren't going to let it be born without you. Just come here and do your thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I love that, that birthing scene as well. It just gives you that, you know, that the sense of innocence, I suppose. You know, it's it's just this little tiny thing coming out of an egg, but it's remarkable in itself. And, and, and the effort that goes into just letting the little raptor just pushing its way through, you know, really takes its time. It's... And and it ties into the whole theme of obviously life finding a way. You know, it's it keeps trying, keeps trying until it gets out. Of course, Hammond helps a little bit by taking some of the shell off. But. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that was that was more um, just just uh, so 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 that the fantastic animatronic creation uh, could could be seen properly as it, as it was appearing. Yeah, it was a really cool animatronic as well. Like the. It does look alive because it's all gooey and wet, 
you know, and that's that's what gives it that air of authenticity. Yeah, and the way it cracks through the shell and stuff, it's just very, very impressive the way that they did that. And I mean, I'm sure we'll talk about it later on, but the use of animatronics through this film and uh, their choice of when to use it, when to go for CG is is great throughout. Yeah. It's kind of Spielberg learning these lessons from Jaws in that respect, isn't it? You know, when it comes to... Sometimes it's more effective to not show you what's going on. So the, the opening scene that you talked about earlier, you don't see the Velociraptor. Yeah. You know, you, you see what it does and, and you get kind of a close-up glimpse of its eye and stuff, but you don't actually see it. And that ends up making it more effective because it gives you that air of mystery and that menace and this unseen foe and all that. You know, it's um, it's great. And all the sequences in this film where the, you know, where tension needs to be built, it's just, they're so amazingly tense. During my numerous rewatches, so every time... Uh, Got, uh, got got the scene of Lex and, and Tim hiding from the raptors in the kitchen. I mean, just just uh, going into that scene, I'd actually start to get goosebumps. Just like like uh, just 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 because just because like the the, the entire sequence is is like so tense and terrifying and fantastically shot and structured. Yeah, and then you obviously you you reminded of Alan's uh, t- frightening the Alan frightening the child at the start of the film. Where it talks specifically about what a Velociraptor will do to you, and exactly, you're like, oh, we know what's coming. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like in Titanic, where Leonardo DiCaprio tells you what will happen if you jump into freezing water. You know, because it, it, it kind of makes the the ending part where that happens to them more visceral because you've had that, that description of what's happening, and um, so you get this impression of, oh God, these people are screwed if these raptors catch them, and. Obviously, it shows how intelligent they are. They can open doors. They can, um, they flank them. Although they're not smart enough to know what a reflection is. That is their downfall. Ah, but they've learned now, and they won't get fooled by that again. Yeah, but then one of them's locked in the freezer, so that's true. You know. <laughs> yeah, no more. So they, they they won't experience reflections, possibly again. Kind of a bit about the discussion that they have while they're having sea bass. Uh, I mean, I love that conversation it's one of my favorite scenes in the film because as i said before all the opinions come forward and you know you get you get the thing about these scientists think that john hammond's a bit of a hack because i keep wanting to say richard hammond it's very <laughs> different. <laughs> Just you're opening up so many alternate universes here craig that i want to see <laughs> richard hammond like <laughs> park owner. <laughs> well, he owns a farm. He could make it happen. It, true, true. He could put T Rexes on his farm. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, but like Ellie pointing out that he doesn't know what he's doing because he's got plants that are poisonous in the building that are just there because they look nice. Um, Malcolm, aka the Goldblum, gives him the whole you patented it, packaged it, and slapped it on a plastic lunchbox, and then. Later on, you see the plastic lunchbox, and the like. It's it's just such a clever little debate that they all have, and um, and obviously you've got the lawyer who just sees dollar signs in his eyes. It's very eerily shot that with the sort of projectors on either side, the clicking that you hear throughout, with the pictures changing and everything. Like you say, it's one of those scenes that as a kid you go, oh, it's the boring talking scene, <laughs> and I don't like the boring talking scene. Or when do they go out and see the dinosaurs? You know, but when you watch it, it is a, like, a very eerily shot scene. And it is one of those scenes where, at that point, they can change Hammond to a villain if they had decided to go down a different track. That's the bit where he would be, you're all wrong, I'm right. You'll see. I, 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 will, I will show you all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the, scene. that's the scene where it all switches, you know. That's the moment. But it doesn't. You know, it's, um, it's very smart. It's... Very for me, and it's it's the the bit where he turns to Grant, thinking that he was going to get support, sort of unanimous support from him, and he doesn't. Yeah, Spielberg loves his backlighting, though. That's why the projectors are there for no other reason. Oh yeah, yeah, but yeah. look, but also the sound and back. You know, you get that. It's very. Hmm. Yeah, I do. I do love that conversation, and uh, <laughs> I love when the lawyer just says things like. Um, we can charge 2000 a day, 10000 a day, and people will pay it. And he's like, no, no, I'm not doing this to cater for the super rich. And he's like, yeah, we could have, like, a coupon day or something. 
<laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, uh, 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 from the from the from the char- characterization of that guy, did you ever get the impression that that, that Spielberg uh, had had some bad experiences with lawyers? Well, yeah, yeah. because. Spielberg puts a lot of himself in his films. You notice how most of his pra- protagonists are orphans and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's not the case in this film, but um, although Lex and Tim's parents are going through a divorce, and that's got something, you know, the, there was something about Spielberg's parents doing that in his past that seems to have stuck with him. So a lot of his, yeah, a lot of his like characters in his films are, are very much echoing his life in some way. So. I wouldn't be surprised if maybe trying to get this film made, uh, there was some legal issues that he ran into, or just yeah, as you say, some bad experience with lawyers, the blood-sucking lawyer. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I I certainly got the impression that that there would have been there would have been that he would have had a degree of catharsis from giving him the possibly the most humiliating death imaginable. <laughs> That is a good death. It's one of the many memorable moments. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, and even and e- even even watching that as as a little kid, uh, despite what, uh, watching a grown man be, be being, ripped, being ripped in half by 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 by, by, by a gigantic ramp, rampaging monster, yeah, it's like the fact that he's on the toilet made it hilarious. Yeah, it's very darkly funny, isn't it? That's the that's why it works so well because is when oh, that's that's terrifying and disturbing but also really funny i mean what a way to go <laughs> yeah when you gotta go you gotta go <laughs> it's quite funny how there's a toilet right next to the t-rex um paddock as well it's possibly prophetic because a lot of people may crap themselves when they see a tyrannosaurus right but i even yep. like that it was an unsuccessful viewing as well they basically they raised the goat from the goat pit I don't know, they must have some automated goat delivery system underneath there. <laughs> and then the goat sort of drops up and they go, and, oh, nothing happened. Oh, right, let's move them along. It's like they've not seen anything so far. <laughs> you you are actually going to have dinosaurs on your dinosaur tour. Yeah. 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 I did like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, though you do have to wonder why, why there was even a, to- a toilet there in the first place. If the, uh, um, if the ride well, if the tour was designed to be completely automated with, with nobody ever getting out of the cars. I'm guessing it would have to stop at some point. Or maybe a staff facility. Yeah. Could but be. for it only to be a toilet and nothing else, no other buildings nearby, you know. And this yeah. is and this is where the T Rex keepers stay, where you know, this is where they keep the brush for mucking it out and the extra straw and yeah. And the goats. <laughs> Huh, that would be a horrible job mucking out a T Rex. <laughs> <Just, laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it makes as much sense to talk about it now. The T Rex scene is just one of the most iconic moments in cinema history. It's just, it's it's a masterstroke of tension and um, visual effects and everything. Just, I mean, even the well, obviously it's so iconic. The the glass. The glass oh, yeah. of water, you know, the, the yeah. rippling of the glass of water, which was apparently accomplished by guitar strings underneath the dashboard in the car. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. It was it was guitar strings. I, I I thought it was piano wire, but guitar strings. Yeah, I mean, it's just it from that moment on, it's kind of iconic, isn't it? There's yeah. just the noise, the ominous noise in the background, the the ripples in the glass of water, and you just ah, oh, it's incredible. Um, one of the things I particularly loved about that scene it, it, it is just with, with the, the the visual effects of the T Rex itself. It was, uh, just like the level of attention uh, attention to detail that was on display. I mean, say, say like say like uh, like when like when when you see when you see the shot of like like of, of, of this like gigantic foot coming down like in front front in front of the cars, yeah um yeah I, I, as I, I as it as it leaves its footprint like like the you see you see the mud bee being being slightly pushed to the side, yeah, um, or yeah or or when or when it's in uh, when it's. Uh, be, being drawn to being drawn towards the car that the, the Lex, Lex and Tim are in, like, like with a torch shining at it. Yeah, when 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 the torch beam is, like 
is directly in its eye. You you you, you see is 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 people contract. Yeah, and it's. I mean, the visual effects are still flawless as far as I'm concerned. The version I watched on Sunday was a 4K transfer, and it may not be real 4K, but it's beautiful. And then um, that scene in particular, just you you can't see the the strings, so to speak. You just can't. They're they're hidden so well. And I mean, if you look at Jurassic World, like how can Jurassic World look worse than a film that predates it by 20 years? Because of exactly what you said at the beginning, which is that the the direction now seems to be show more show everything whereas before it was show what you need to show for that scene yeah. you know keep it minimal don't you know don't blow your budget all at once on something and it's that use of of practical effects now i know they still use practical effects in jurassic world um just not to the same extent i think as they did in in jurassic park and they try and fit in it's going to be more dinosaurs it's going to be more on this screen and more on that screen and it ends up looking too fake you know well the the reason that cgi sometimes doesn't fool people isn't because it's necessarily bad cgi it's just because your eye gets used to it eventually and detects that it's artificial so if you trick the eye by throwing in some real elements here and there so, you know, you're, you've got a dinosaur that's partially real but completed with CGI or whatever, then, you know, your eye doesn't have time to adjust and, and you're kept, your brain is kept guessing as to what's real and what isn't. So that's why it, it works so much better. Whereas pure CGI, you eventually just become used to it and you, you start to see the flaws. And that's, that's why the, the technology is, is far from perfect because because no one has devised a way for the brain not to um, not to notice it. I think one of the one of the reasons why 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 the effects do hold up is is it is, is, is because of the, they they were created like with 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 a mix of of CGI and animatronics. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and yes, yes, and and for um, yeah, and and some of the time, like, it, 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 it can be difficult to to to, to tell like, like well. Which uh, which effects were created with with with, with which particular te- technique? Some of the bigger set pieces are like, are are obviously obviously going to be CGI, just because they because it would be completely impractical. Yeah. But because the effects had that phys- that uh, physical ac- aspect mi- mi- mixed into them, yeah, the, um, then it affords it an extra level of realism, like for lack of a better word. Well, I mean, the flock of Gallimimus is a pure CGI sequence, isn't it? Um, but the the thing about that is they're moving very fast, so you don't really have time to tune into the detail. And you know, you have the the side effects of the uh, the log being moved as they interact with it or whatever. So it's not just you're not just watching um, dinosaurs running around. You know, you see them making an impact on the world around them. So it, it hides itself really well. And then the T Rex shows up there as well, which. Um, I don't know whether it's a miniature or not, but it looks amazing. But in the, the, the T-Rex attack bit, you know, there's just so many different aspects to it. It's just, you know, you've got the, the slow reveal, and then you've got the, you know, the nail-biting tension as they try to stay absolutely still as they're terrified. And you've even got the very childlike um, fake safety thing when Tim closes the door of the car because... He's inside hmm. the car. He must be completely safe, you know. And then obviously the T Rex bursts into the roof. The roof to that tells you, nope, not safe in here. Just these little messages it keeps sending you that you know that this is a really horrible situation and there's no real safety from it. And you have Alan trying to stay, stand still because the T Rex mm-hmm. vision is based on movement and and he's got a couple of screaming kids to deal with. Just brilliant. It, it is one of those, and then it's uh, it's like, oh great, they're in the car, tinned goods for the dinosaur. It, uh, <laughs> it, it sort of peels the car apart, you know, chewing the tyre rubber yeah. and just ripping through it. And the T-Rex uh, behaves like a living thing as well. Yes. Like where it tries to eat the tyre, and then, no, don't like that, and and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's not, I mean, I've seen some things where they're trying to make you believe that a giant animal is attacking. And the the animal only attacks in the way that you know it, it wanders up to the people and attacks them. But the T Rex is out of its paddock for the first time. It's looking around. It's getting used to being free, and it's kind of 
sussing out what's going on and that helps make it more real as well yeah and the fact that they attract its attention it starts not playing with the car but it's going well what's inside what's making the noise inside let me open it up and have a look can i eat that is that food (laughs) excellent uh you know it's new goats it's nice screaming goats and (laughs) (laughs) it's so good that it makes you forget the fact that there's no way it could have actually got out of its paddock because of the giant dam that seems to (laughs) exist (laughs) just beyond the fence It is, it is one of those where you're like, how, how did it go? It just climbed its way up. But I suppose it, was, it had a bit of level where the goats, uh, where the goat was, didn't it? So yeah. So what's going on? <laughs> because it it escapes where the goat was, um, and then when they go through the fence where the goat was, suddenly it's a massive drop. <laughs> I, l- I like that they put the goat feeding area at like the weakest point of the fence. If that's the case, it's like the whole way around its paddock. It's got a nice big concrete wall and a fence. And at that point, they're like, "Nope, we're going to raise it up. It will be just the fence." And because uh, we're never going to switch the electric off, are we? No, no. There's no no such thing as a power cut here. No, 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 no. <laughs> Wouldn't be any way. No, 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 no. It's absolutely fine. Nothing to see here. But it's going to be there all the time because that's where we're feeding it goats. No, there's no problem. Uh, no problem at all. <laughs> Ten thousand volts, though. <laughs> yes. It's possibly enough to subdue a T-Rex, but not enough to kill a small child. Hey, I'm not giving mouth to mouth to the T-Rex if it if it, <laughs> if it passes out. Okay, I draw the line. Well, listening to you talk about that, um, it, um, it actually seems that I've actually been been under a bit of a misconception because I always it, I always inter- interpreted that that drop as being on the on the like on the the other side of, like of of the road, if you like. Oh, right. No, it's, I think it's. De- it, it, no, but it's because it is where the cars are. Because it pushes the car just slightly over the gap. So it's where the first car is. That's where the first car stops. It's where the T-Rex escapes. Because it walks out between the two cars. Yeah, because they drive up later on in the other Jeep. Yeah. The, the even less uh, well-protected open-top Jeep. <laughs> but the one that's like at least 31 miles per hour. <laughs> <laughs> it's Meals on wheels Jeep. That with one. its mirror that doesn't add up. Objects are larger than they appear, but it's right there. <laughs> it should be like, do <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, 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 so it seems that it seems that I have a complete lack of spatial awareness. Then, watch the scene again, and now I've ruined it for you. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so here, I, yes, and, and yes, and 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 you see, and see, if you have ruined that for me, yeah, yeah, then and then, then every other every time I, I I watch the film, like from now until until the end of my life, yeah, yes, yes, I, I I'm I'm going to think of you, and I will curse you, yeah, 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 for for like for for spoiling um well for spoiling what I would other other otherwise can consider an, an, an absolute perfection of a scene. <laughs> Damn you. Well, it doesn't ruin the scene for me. It's just something that, that I notice every time. I only actually noticed it a couple of years ago as well. So such is the, the cinematic magic that I managed to not notice that. It's same with them um, at the end when the T-Rex shows up without a sound in the visitor centre. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, did, I did pick up on that, but I let it slide just because it was awesome. Yeah, but it's, you know, they're, so they're all frantically trying to avoid the raptors and then the T-Rex just tiptoes in apparently. But it would have been in someone's peripheral vision at that point as well. It also so, would have taken out a large portion of wall. That part stacks up because you can see the you can see the other side of the entryway is like still under construction. So there is oh, a right, hole okay. big enough for it to get through. I thought that myself, but then I rewatched and rewatched and then tried to figure out the logistics of it. So if it came through that wall, it's okay. It would have had to duck and stuff, but it would have got in. So it tiptoed, did a bit of gymnastics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's an awesome scene. Very awesome. Yeah, it's great. Uh, one of my favourite, I mean, it's all one of my favourite with this film, but one of one of the striking parts as well is the, the sick triceratops scene, um, which is quite an interesting bit of animatronic stuff, cause, so they couldn't build an animatronic triceratops that could walk around but they could build one where it's you know where it's stomach could raise to signify it's breathing and it could open it's eyes and stuff so you know it was a nice little 
um, use of making great use of limitations because it was just a sick thing that all it had to do was lie there and have the characters react to it. It didn't have to do anything, and that was that was great. It's it's such uh, a nice scene, and it so it, that's where you get to see uh, sort of Grant's amazement at what he's doing. You know, he's lying on top of it as it's breathing in and out, and the look on his face as that's going on. And I mean, I don't know. Do you, did you ever get the explanation as to why it was sick? I can't remember. No, I mean, there was no, talk of it being you. things, but I don't think yeah. they ever tell you why it was yeah. sick. Yeah, it's a completely pointless scene, actually. In, in that it, respect, it, yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't lead to anything. It doesn't hint, as far as I'm aware, at anything that goes on later on. But it is just sort of very well put. It sets your characters up in a way. In well, that it gets scene, you've Ellie already had them from the group. That, it gets Ellie separated from the group, but it's it does it as a is a good reason. It shows that she's quite knowledgeable in her field. Again, it establishes that she does know what she's talking about in a way. Though I do feel that you've got like trained man that's been working with these dinosaurs for let's presume a few years, standing next to it, and she's telling him, "Have you checked this? Have you checked that?" Yeah. Oh well, I get the impression that that guy is useless. You know, it's um, what's. It's the bit where Ellie's like, the pupils are dilating. He's like, yeah, yeah, I totally noticed that too. Yeah, uh, dilating. Yeah, honest. <laughs> yeah. He's just standing yeah, there. Di- like, dinosaur. Like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, I know. <laughs> Although the book does explain it. Apparently in nature, I don't, I don't know how true this is, but apparently several large animals, they'll ingest boulders. So they'll have boulders in their stomach because they can't chew their food. So it lets the basically it lets the food break up by the boulders rubbing against it so, and then eventually they'll just spit out the boulders um, in the book it tells you that's what the triceratops is doing and when it does that it eats the berries as well which poisons uh. it yeah well, yeah, well, well I, I, do, I do remember uh, reading, reading, some, reading something like that about, I, about dinosaurs just when I was a kid it just because like, when I was young I was absolutely obsessed with dinosaurs which is probably one of the reasons why I love this film so much. Yeah, um, some animals that we have do it as well. Um, I don't know. That's where they've approximated much of the stuff they know about dinosaurs from, is basically look for something similar in nature today and, and work it out from that. Yeah. Gastrolith is what it's called. So a gastrolith... <laughs> check, out, check out for Education or Corner Kids. <laughs> uh, a gastrolith, also called a stomach stone or gizzard stone, is a rock held inside a gastro- gastrointestinal tract. Um, blah blah blah. So, among living vertebrates, gastro. I could just put the Wikipedia article. Wikipedia is your friend, I've, kids. I started now. Yeah, uh, you started now. Don't finish. You know, I, I'm um, wanting okay. to hear now. Gastroliths are common amongst crocodiles, alligators, herbivorous birds, seals, and sea lions. Well, that I didn't know. Yeah. No. So basically, they, they eat rocks or boulders or, or whatever so that they can chew their food. Fact of the day. There you go. And that's what happens with the dinosaurs. Although the film never tells you that, so... You know, it's this weird bit. Again, there's so much going on that you kind of forget about that. And as a kid, you're watching it and it's like, oh, look, he's like, he's raising up and then shrink going down again with the, uh, with the breathing. <laughs> and... Ha ha ha! She's uh, she's got her hand in dinosaur poo, which still abuses me to this day. It has to I, be said. I just like the casual look he gives his shoes as he walks away to make sure he's not trodden on any. And there's oh, a there's, mountain of it next to him. Yeah. A mountain it's, of it. You do and it's hear like, a kind oh, of squelch in. as he yeah. steps in something. And he checks his shoe. <laughs> <there. laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, I, I, I was I was always always slightly 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 weird weirded out. I mean, like, uh, but by just how, by just how casually uh, I, uh, the, 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 the Ellie w- 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 was moving her arms about after after, after pull, pull, pulling it out out of the mound, <laughs> it's, it's like it's like it's like okay, like, like, like okay okay well, you were wearing gloves yeah, yes, but, yes, but yeah but they are not covered in crap. I guess you have noticed like you're squatting down and 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 your legs are bare. Why are your arms so close so close to, to like to your bare skin? Where you could get covered in crap because I'm just kind of germophobic like that. Yeah. I just. There's some thing. on her leg as well, on the inside of her leg. 4K, guys. You notice these things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, her character in that scene is quite it, it really amusing, though, just the way she kind of goes into full research mode and shuts the world out. 
where she's just like every six weeks you know <laughs> just put mutter into herself as she walks off well Malcolm's like uh, or Ian is like uh, you are going to wash your hands before you eat anything I like that it's all the fault of just some fat IT guy that shuts the system down because he wants to get paid more money it sounds like he's in some sort of debt though as well I've, I, I hadn't picked up on his conversation before where he's talking about how much he gets paid by Hammond to sort the system and Hammond sit there going well my money my, you know your worry, money problems are nothing to do with me <laughs> like, yeah what's it, the, like um, it or like it or lump it kind of thing yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah like, like they're exactly that your problems yeah. yeah I'm sorry about your financial problems but they are your problems and then they have a bit of an argument and then um, and then Dennis is yeah well he's, he's just about to enact his horrific plan but when he's when he's talking to uh, Dotson earlier in the film the bit where he says, um, don't get cheap on me, which is hilarious because he's just eaten everything <laughs> in that restaurant and then makes the other guy pay for it. But he ends the sentence with saying, that was Hammond's mistake. And then it cuts to the helicopter arriving at the island. So it's, it's a nice little setup for, this is also Hammond's mistake. It's interesting to contrast the, the, the Ned, Nedry feel, feels he's getting underpaid. Can you compare that against the, the number t- number of times that ha- Hammond, Hammond mentions no expense having been spared. <laughs> yeah, spared no expense, yeah. Um, I wonder if Nedry is actually getting underpaid or whether his debt is so high that he's he's blinded to what real like real accomplishment, real money is. Yeah, 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 well, yeah, well I, I, I always decided like, that, that, that he had a gambling problem yeah, and, 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 he, and he was... In a large amount, large amount of debt to some scary people who were threatening to 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 um, break various body parts. Yeah, he's not in the book, is he? I can't remember. Yeah, I've not read the book, so I wouldn't be able to say. I mean, the bit the bit I don't get is it's this is where sort of stupidity comes in again, and you're going, okay, so he he puts his little program in to disable some of the security systems. But it doesn't disable some of the security systems. It's every fence. It's not like, oh, I need to I need to open a couple of doors here and a couple of doors there. Well, I'll open those doors. No, it's just like, I will switch off every fence and just crash my way through, leave all the gates open, I'm going to get away, and no one will ever know it was me, apart from everyone that knows it was clearly me that did it. Except from the raptor fences, he doesn't... Oh, yeah, the raptor... Yeah, yeah he, he was smart enough to keep the raptors in. Well, I mean, it's not as if he could go back to his job after stealing the embryos, because it'd be pretty obvious that he did it, because there's only about six people there or something, so... Um, so I get the impression that it's very much a scorched-earth type plan. He's like, I don't care. I don't care how much disruption I cause. I've got to, I just have to get out of here. And obviously, was, he gets his just desserts anyway. And what a brutal way to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just think he's so funny. Though. I mean, the first time you see him, he's just like pigging out. And then you see his desk and there's just wrappers everywhere, including the floor. And, he's <laughs> and uh, Samuel L. Jackson puts it perfectly when he's like, look at this workstation. What a complete slob. But I like the fact that he's like he's he's obviously been smart enough to go in and he's able to program this whole automated system so only three people would need to work here and you're going, well that really is an automated goat system, isn't it? <laughs> it was like we only need three people on the whole island. <laughs> it's minimal staff for up to three days, so eventually you'll need more people in. But yeah, the automation is, is a big hallmark of it. He just you just sit there and think, you know, he's smart enough to do all that and then he manages to <laughs> I don't think he was an- anticipating the storm I think that was part of the issue He wasn't anticipating the storm but as soon as he knew the storm was happening he could have went before There didn't could seem have. to be reasoning behind him sort of hanging back until the worst possible moment to do his thing um, Well I think he had to wait till the tour had finished because he had to shut down the system so he The tour hadn't finished when he that. ran away did it? Uh, no it had um, that stopped. Well, they were returning the cars to the garage, and and so on. And I think it was just stopped at that point. I don't know, but he's, yeah, he covered his tracks really well. He has his infamous little gif, his audio gif. Please, God damn it! Hate this hacker crap. 
And I love his little Skype call that he has with the guy at the docks that's clearly just a quick time video that he's pressed play on. Or that someone yeah. pressed play on. Yeah, 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 you can you can even see even see the progress bar beneath yeah, it. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just one of those nitpicks that you pick up, you know, over the years. Like you don't care. I mean it's not like it's not anything to be caring about. Um he is very much a fat guy stereotype though. He's like the very much the IT guy stereotype. You know, like he snacks a lot and um and he talks a lot of like nerdy language and, and all that stuff. Um I do I do love it when, when Hammond says, Find Nedry, check the vending machine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, like, that's where he'll be. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, yeah, 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 and, and, and also the also the the and the problems I, of 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 the whole system were literally fixed by turning them off and on again. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's very much a an IT thing that still still occurs. Yeah. yeah, have you turned the entire island off and back on again? <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the Velociraptors will get out. It's like, yeah, but the the fence will work. But, it's, but they're going to break through the fence. It's like, but the the parts they don't break through, they will they'll be fine. Yeah, um, it seems that Nedry doesn't care about the people that are there though. And after you after you mentioned Nedry's workstation be, 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 being like being like being like a part of having the, the detritus, I, I'm actually looking looking at my own horrifically un, untidy computer desk. <laughs> Covered in random, random piles of paper and empty juice bottles and ch- chocolate bar wrappers. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, Dennis Nedry. Oh it? my god. He's gonna he's gonna free oh. the dinosaurs. Oh god. I think they could have done a bit more with his kind of relationships to the other characters. You do get the bit of animosity between him and Hammond, but other than that, you you don't really get anything. He's just kind of it sets him up as being the the catalyst for everything happening, but. Yeah, he's very one-dimensional. He's probably the most one-dimensional character in the film, which, as I said earlier, is fine because of what the purpose he serves. Yeah, and, and also when when you when you have that many other characters who are who are all really interesting in in different ways. Yep, yeah, 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 Then having having a single one-dimensional stereotype is, is forgivable. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've ever played the Telltale Jurassic Park game. That came out a couple of years ago. I haven't no. No, uh, it follows up on the whole um, plan that that Nedry is involved in. So I think you you follow at least one of the characters who's there trying to find that thing. So you find the um, the aerosol can, which is a really clever hiding, <laughs> you know, hiding system. It's very James Bond styley, isn't it? It is. And Nedry clearly likes it. He's he's like very oh, enamoured yeah. with him. <laughs> Although he put shaving foam on his last piece of pie, which always bothered me. Like, no, you can't eat that. It's covered in, like, shaving foam. I don't know. It just bothers me. I also like that he's giving away the guy's name as he goes over to the table. He's like, no one cares. No one cares what your name is. (laughs) There is one extra in the background who does. (laughs) (laughs) He looks round, you know, as you would if someone was yelling someone's name across a restaurant. You would probably have a look. Yeah, no one there actually cares because who's going to know it was him? Yeah. Who's going to care? And yeah, and is, is there ever any any, exc- any um, explanation in like, kind of any supplemental stuff as to, as to who the guy actually was? He just works for this other company that's a rival of Hammond's, and they're trying to do genetic research as well, and they they're falling way behind. That's all it is. Yeah, 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 I just found it a little, a little frustrating that like the the that the guy who is effectively the catalyst of for 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 every, 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 everything that goes goes wrong is also the also, also like, like the least significant person in, in the whole film. Yeah, although sometimes you get that with catalysts, you know, they they just make something happen and then they leave. Because there's not needed after that point. Because you couldn't have Nedry in it after this point, you know, after that point, because he, he's point, he's worthless at, after that. What's going to happen is, uh, what would happen is the other characters would just drag him around and talk about how much they hate him, and they'd lean into the fat guy stereotype of him being like complaining that he has to walk and things like that. 
Maybe Spielberg doesn't like fat people. Maybe that's what we're finding out here. I like that that's your take home from it. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne Knight is usually quite such a charming, if bungling sort of guy, though, so it is, it's almost playing against type for him, isn't it? It is, but it's, I, I don't know. I think a lot of it is, oh, he gets his just deserves in the end. You know what I mean? He gets exactly what he deserves. Yeah. You know, after all that he's done, all the, the mayhem that he's caused for the other characters, you're like, of course he deserves, you know. He he deserves a dinosaur-related death way more than the lawyer does. Yeah. Well, it was it was funny that he was just like, go, go get the stick. The, the Dilophosaurus looks at him as if he's an, an idiot. Because hmm. <laughs> he is. He's just an idiot. And, of course, he dies because he has no respect for nature. There's another theme there. He dies because he can't drive a 4 by 4 in the rain. There's that too. <laughs> but like, and he can't, he but can't he get the steam off his glasses. Well, then he loses his glasses as well. But it's okay, because he can afford more glasses. Yeah, and then, and then he has no eyes. And then he's, that's it, he's gone. And then he's, and then he's a very, very generous meal for a small dinosaur. I mean that that uh, Dilophosaurus could probably live off him for a few days. <laughs> I think we've uh, I think we've savaged poor Dennis too, uh, quite poor too guy. much. But yeah, like in Third Rock from the Sun, he's just a nice like he's he's a kind of put upon, pretty incompetent it has to be said, but police officer. Um, but he's you know there's he's harmless and charming. So um, I didn't see Third Rock from the Sun till after this, but it is an interesting contrast to what people might know him from. Yeah, I've seen him in a couple of comedy shows, but yeah, he's, he's not someone that I've seen lots of in other things. This is where I know him from best, I would say. Is he not uh, Is he not Michael Jordan's friend in uh, Space Jam as well? I think so, actually, yeah. <laughs> Space Jam, there's another classic. He was also a, a random police officer in Basic Instinct. <laughs> and I just have, have this, this guy, uh, this um, abiding memory of like like during this of Sharon the Sharon Stone leg crossing scene, I got of like of, 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 the, of, like the the camera having a disproportionate amount of focus like on on his face on his face and his reaction to it. I just this just I just this like really kind of uncomfortable nervous sweating. Oh dear. Yeah, I've only seen Basic Instinct once. Purely for research purposes, of course. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, what about the kid characters, uh, Lex and Tim? They're they aren't too precocious, which I like. You know, they feel like kids. They behave like kids, and I like how they bicker between each other. You know, the the fence climbing scene where uh, she's like, "I bet I can reach the top and and get to the other side and down at the bottom before you can even get to the top and and all that stuff." So they. Not only that, they just feel like siblings as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, in 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 my, uh, uh, one one particular exchange between them, I, I always liked was when they're climbing a tree to, to, to spend the night, and uh, Tim Tim comments is like, "Oh, I, I hate I hate trees," and like says, "I don't mind them." Yeah, you weren't in the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I mean I do like the um, the car scene, you know, where it ends <laughs> where it ends with a car not quite crushing them. And it's like, we're back in the car again, so, but at least we're out of the tree. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously Lex is a, she's a vegetarian, because of course she is. And um, she hates dinosaurs that eat meat, because they want to eat her, I guess. Yeah, I think that's more a fear of the dinosaurs wanting to eat them than anything else. But but yeah, I think the kids' characters are alright in this. They're not unbearable. And... Uh, as a kid, you're like, oh, they got to see dinosaurs and everything, don't you? You, know, you kind of find them, and I think the the brother sister dynamic works. Yeah. And of course, they have the clumsy bit of foreshadowing that uh, Lex is a is a hacker. It's an interactive CD-ROM. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. yeah, I prefer to be called a hacker. It's like, okay. And what do you hack exactly? <laughs> Yeah, the, I mean the Unix systems. Obviously, that's how <laughs> stupid it is. But could you imagine if that was your computer's operating system? Right, I just need to open up my documents. Once I find it in about five or ten minutes, 
as it slowly <laughs> scrolls across all the folders. Everyone else up until that point has had a very quick to use sort of command line clicky system and then now now it's this weird box system that we've never seen on anyone else's screen until now. Well you see it when she opens the file it, it looks like Nedry's screen after that. Although I think they're on Macs because it says like Macintosh HD uh, on Nedry's screen at one point. 4K bitches. You notice this stuff. <laughs> From like an, an outside uh, technical perspective, and I, I never understood how uh, do, uh, it's a, how uh, how they, how they managed to, managed to managed to create like uh, like some of, some of the most um, iconic uh, iconic and in, in in and enduring CG effects in cinema history. Um, yet yet when when actually. Mimic, mimicking a computer interface, all they all, 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 all managed, managed to give it is blocky vector graphics. <laughs> I think that's part of the misguided nature of Hammond's project, really. You know, he buys this thing because it's expensive and, and new and whatever, but it's actually not very good. It's not very user-friendly at all. And um, Yeah, it takes five minutes to find a folder. And you've got to turn your entire island off and on again in order to reset the system. Yeah, there seems to be no redundancies in that respect, yeah. Yeah, although that was because Nedry had activated his white rabbit object, wasn't it? That's true. I think under normal circumstances they'd be able to shut down and, <laughs> and reinitialize that a little bit. I love that thing, and I love in that scene how uh, Tim is standing there watching Lex work when she could be handing the gun to the, <laughs> the other two people. <laughs> When he could be handing a gun to the other two people, sorry. Um, and meanwhile, Ellie is sitting there at the door's hinges, which will do absolutely nothing to get to keep it closed. It's a weirdly executed scene, actually. Yeah, well, I think it, 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 it was it was just uh, structured like like to 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 create a, a degree of panic and intensity. Yeah. Um, rather than any kind of logical thinking. Yeah, and then it proves useless once they fix it anyway, because raptors can go through glass. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it has one of the coolest images at that part, though, where you see the the computer, you know, the 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 code on the computer screen, on the raptor's skin. Yes, actually, yeah, yeah, I really like that shot. Yeah, bit of a reference to how it was made, you know, <laughs> like perhaps, but it's just so memorable. Yeah, the, the raptors in, in the last part of the film, they're just terrifying. Especially because you've had described to you, uh, I think you mentioned this earlier on, especially because you've had described to you at the very beginning how raptors attack yeah. and how threatening and deadly they are. Yeah, yeah the thing is, and, uh, you know, and, and also uh, once you actually know what uh, uh, what, what what it does with with, with a giant middle, middle claw, yeah, yeah, but then and just just like uh, he, uh, he, he, hearing it faintly clicking on the floor as it yeah. as it like stalks toward towards the kids. Yeah, it is great. Um, it's also how relentless they are; they just cannot be stopped. You know, they, you get to a point, you get to the end of a particular sequence, and you might think, ah, oh, that's them dealt with now. One's in the freezer, or. Good, they're in the control room. They fixed the lock. It's fine. They're they're safe. Nope. You know, okay, they're in the vents. They're safe now. Nope. They're back in the entryway. Nope. <laughs> it's until the T Rex comes up and saves them that um, that, that that they are finally safe. The way that like, the, the 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 raptors are are portrayed visually, like uh, like when when you when you see when you, when, you, when you see shots shots of their heads, like it uh, goes back to when uh, like the 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 gate their gamekeeper. Uh, Muldoon, is his name. Um, but yeah, yeah, just uh, but, uh, like, like uh, at the start when when first appears, he's talking about the, about the raptors, I guess, and 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 says that says that like when, 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 when that when you look at them, like, like you like, you can you can see them see, see them figuring you out. Yeah. Like, and and when you when you see shots of shots shots of their, of their head kind of looking around, like like their their eyes uh, have this kind of like kind of this kind of intelligent intensity to them, because 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 they aren't just. Is that they're, 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 they're this just this kind of blundering force of nature like the T Rex, like they like they, they are they're, like they, they are this like thinking, ca- thinking calculating hunter, like like this this uh, working out the best plan of attack. 
<coughs> also when you've had the thing where they're saying, oh, they're trying the fences. You know, they go back to the same spots. They're looking for weaknesses. You know, they're proper calculating. Like you say, whereas the T-Rex is just such a big brute that it can bash through basically whatever it wants to. Where the raptors are there going, we've worked out how to use the door handles now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unless they can figure out how to open doors. It's like, oh, look. <laughs> yeah. Immediate shot of a raptor opening a door. <laughs> yeah. It's, oh no, they can open doors. Well, the thing is, that's not necessarily a sign of intelligence because some cats can open doors. I was just going to say that. I mean, I mean yeah, I mean, because uh, I, 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 um, actually, actually got to the point where, uh, where, where, uh, where our uh, bedroom door handles actually uh, had, 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 had to be turned the other way up. Because the cats have figured out how to figure out the, 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 the handle handles press press down to open them. <laughs> yes, yeah, so so, that, that, so now they they need to be they be, need to be pushed up to get in. All right, fair enough. Um, Wait, which keeps them out? We'll figure Clever that out, boy. Clever <laughs> 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 yeah, um, Muldoon's a good. He's another one of these kind of one-dimensional type characters, but he's the he's almost the voice of reason in every scene he's in. So the, the bit where they see the raptor cage and he says, they should all be destroyed. And then later on, he's the one that's warning them against all the all the things that can go wrong, basically. How many times did I tell you we need locking mechanisms on the vehicle doors? It's like, well, why didn't they think of that immediately? <laughs> it's just it's anyone like, so can get out at any point they want. Yeah. yeah, It's so they can use the toilet, that's what it is. It's another indication of how little thought Hammond has, has actually... Has actually Put into like the intricacies of how everything would operate, because mm-hmm. yeah, he just he's just been so overwhelmed and, and excited like with, with, with what he's managed to achieve, and he hasn't thought it all, thought it all through. Completely not polluted, yeah. spared no expense. <laughs> well, it's kind of like it, it's the, the same way he deals with the people is the same way he's dealt with the dinosaurs, and he's not went for instinct on either side. You know, the instinct for someone is to get out of the car to go and have a closer look. So, of course, they're going to try the door handle and they're going to get out of the car. In the same way that he's not quite taken into account the way the dinosaurs are going to behave. It's like, uh, it wants to hunt the goat, it doesn't want the goat delivered on a platter. Yeah. It's going to wait until it wants to take it. It's not necessarily going to do it as soon as the goat arrives kind of thing. Yeah, it's some kind of commentary on animals in captivity, isn't it? But, like... Um, it's. I mean, it's not an especially deep commentary on it, but it is. it does bring a reference to the, you know... You keep lions in a in a cage, so to speak. Then that you're you're fighting against their true nature, and and that's not that's not good, really. You know, it's not good for the lion. Just like the T Rex, it's not good for a T Rex to be in a cage. And I can't imagine what um, what kind of an attraction of Velociraptors would have been, like what their plan for that was. <laughs> you know, they were they just going to put them in front of some two bay glass or whatever. You know. Let people look at them. I don't know. I always, I always wonder. It's like, why breed the deadly ones? They've got all the big, massive ones. It's like, surely you would start with the nice, big, safe ones, and like the veggie eaters, and then move your way onto <laughs> the dangerous stuff. You know, give yourself something back that you can you can display later. To a degree, although people, if they're going to go at a dinosaur park, they're going to want to see a T Rex, aren't they? True. Yeah. And it's like, no, you know, Brachiosaurus, that's that's good and all, but it's no T Rex. But that's where you go, ah, but come back soon, pay your £2,000 a day again soon, <laughs> and then you'll get to see the T Rex. Yeah. Yeah. I paid £2,000 and the T Rex didn't even come out. It's like, ah, well, tough. <laughs> that, come again. <laughs> yeah. There's no guarantee that you'll see a dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, I think we've delayed this long enough. I think we should talk about Jeff Goldblum himself, Ian Malcolm. We haven't really mentioned him. He's just this was, I believe, my first exposure to to the Goldblum. Uh, it would have, it must have been, and yeah, like what a guy. Um, he's just playing himself as usual, but he he talks about like chaos theory and gives you a brief tutorial on it. Very brief, but but there, you know. Goldblum, it's uh, yeah. I think I'm I'm a bit like you. I think that was my first introduction to Jeff Goldblum. Um, 
what kind of... A, a mathematician, a scientist mathematician, a, a, a specialist in chaos theory. You know, it does lead you to go, why, why is a specialist in chaos theory going to a, a theme park? Oh, that's why, because uh, chaos. A uh, scientist specialising in chaos theory, of course that's the theme park that he's going to go to. Uh, it's going to be an absolute disaster, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, any he, he goes. I like that, a, a bit like the sort of gamekeeper, he is a voice of reason for throughout most of the things, and he comes out with the lines that are probably most quoted from it as well. Yeah. You know, a lot of these, you know, in the big philosophical arguments are the ones he, he comes out with, you know, the the sort of classic they were concentrating on so hard on whether they could or not, they didn't stop and ask if they should <laughs> is the line that that sort of reverberates through the whole series at that point. Yeah. Uh, and it's still sort of the mantra and even the life finds a way line I think is still uh, on the poster for the, the upcoming film. <laughs> I like that he's a mathematician that specialises in not solving equations, though. Like, <laughs> that's the whole point. Now, you can't predict these things. These are unsolvable because there's factors that you can't predict, um, yeah. which, you know, is a, a giant theme in the film itself. But the um, I also love the, the antagonistic relationship he has with Hammond, just how much Hammond hates the guy. Um, he even says at one point, I really hate that man. And uh, I love the bickering when uh, Hammond's trying to talk Ellie through the schematic. And he's like, just tell her to follow the wires. And he's like, I understand how to read a schematic. <laughs> tell her to follow the pipes. I do like the fact when he's sitting there in the car, he's talking to himself and he knows that Hammond's watching and he's just taking the mickey out of him remotely. <laughs> like knowing that it'll wind him up. Yeah, oh, it's so good such a good character and then he spends most of the film or a good chunk of the film anyway lying down with his shirt <laughs> open for some reason yeah, lying there in, in possibly the sexiest most provocative pose imaginable <laughs> and then you remember it's Jeff Goldblum and it's like eh, not sure <laughs> yeah it's like I, uh, yeah okay let's go over it and like you two uh, this this was also my first exposure to, to the Goldblum um, and as I just mentioned uh, and in some parts of the film quite literally <laughs> I remember as a young kid, uh, uh, never, uh, never, never, not quite uh, grasping like his sort of purpose in the, uh, in, in the film, because it, I, uh, uh, just uh, because to, because to my simplistic mind, it, it it seemed like he never actually did very much. He was just kind of there. Yeah, he uh, and, comments on stuff. Yeah. And it was only as I got older that um, that, that that I started to like to to understand. Like to understand like that that is comments on the situation, I am, um, and uh, and the f- philosophical perception of the whole situ- the whole situation. Like uh, uh, that that actually 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 was his purpose. Yeah. I am, um, and 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 that and that made him just just as uh, valuable to to the ensemble uh, as people running running around trying to escape the dinosaurs. Yeah, although he is a bit stupid when he uh, adds more. Well, he adds chaos to the the T Rex scene because, um, which you know, thematically is his purpose, the the chaos of the situation. But uh, it looks like Alan's managed to lure the T Rex away in enough time to save the kids, and then Ian comes rushing out, throwing a flare around, and then almost getting himself killed. He's a secondary character, as such. Um, he doesn't. So he spends a lot of the film being quite passive, you know, while other characters are doing the running around. Yeah, I suppose there isn't that much more to say about him. He's just memorable because of what he does with the material he's given. He's memorable for the the delivery of, and obviously with the benefit of hindsight, then, you know, you've got a whole history of Goldblum looking back, and this is, you know, like like we've all said, this is where we were introduced to the Goldblum. So you look back at it slightly differently, I think, than you would have done at the time. Then Independence Day shortly thereafter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Such such prime Goldblum exposure there. Early nineties when you're ready to watch these types of films, you get Goldblum. Amazing. Amazing stuff. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson's in this film. Isn't yes. that amazing? Yes, indeed. Yes, like the Goldblum. Um, like it's it's something. Uh, some, it's a presence like that you can only properly properly appreciate what once you've e- experienced more more of what he's done. 
Yeah. Uh, this is one of his more subdued roles that I can think of, though. Because he's just a... He's just an office manager, really, isn't he? Yeah, he's like another IT guy. Yeah. You know, operations director or whatever he's doing, you know. Please, it I was, hate this hacker crap. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's a lot... I mean, I, I do like it. It's a bit of a shame that he just gets killed off screen. Yeah. <laughs> He gets dismembered off screen, you know. He sort of goes, "Oh well, I'm just, I'm just going out to the back where the raptors are to, uh, to reset the island. Uh, I'm sure none of them have been released while I switched off the power." And he does say, "Hold on to your butts at least twice." <laughs> I don't know. It's a funny I, I, line when you're a kid, but like, it's <laughs> even funnier as an adult, really. <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, well, uh, actually, I, I read um, an, an interview uh, not, not, not that long ago um, you know, where, 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 uh, where I found out that, that, that Samuel Jackson was, was actually supposed, supposed, to have, supposed to have a death scene in the film, yeah, but he, he, ended, he ended up uh, get, get, getting stranded in a hotel by, by a hurricane and wasn't able to get to, get to the, fil- the filming location like, to, 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 to actually film it. Interesting. Yeah. Yes, yes, so, yeah, so, yes, so, yes, so to, to save time and hassle, uh, uh, Spielberg just, just had, had a body prosthetic arm, arm uh, uh, made and bumped him off, off screen. I think it's almost more effective that way, though. Mm. Because it's the point where Ellie's escaped the raptor and she's ready to just relax, and then she thinks, "Oh, there you are! You know, you've been hiding here all this time." And then it's, "Oh my God, his arm!" It's a but proper it's, horror scene, that isn't it? It's like the scene in Jaws where the head just falls out. <laughs> it, you know, it reminds me of that, or perhaps the scene in Jaws reminds me of this because I saw Jaws later than I saw this. Yeah, you know, that's actually quite a good comparison. That, that never occurred to me before. That's why you're here. To have your mind blown. I've ruined a scene and enhanced another one. Balance has been reached in the universe. And I didn't have to snap my fingers to do it. <coughs> so this is a franchise. Now, there are four of these buggers, plus innumerable other things. Um, for me, the sequels are not a patch on this. I think the first half of The Lost World is okay, but then when it becomes effectively a Godzilla film, it's it's not the best. Jurassic Park 3 isn't actually that bad, but it's also very forgettable. You know, it's a, it's a pretty standard, very short sort of B-movie where they run away from dinosaurs that has the Jurassic Park name attached to it. And Jurassic World is a film that makes that is so nostalgic that I'd rather be watching this than watching that. See, I liked the elements of nostalgia in Jurassic World, and I also liked the sort of, okay, they've brung it up to date, they've put new technology in. But I, I kind of think there's like, oh, the same problem, is it's the exact same problems again, just it's managed to open and be successful for a few years beforehand. Well, it's all the inept references to the, the first film as well. You know, you've got the, the, the riff on the, um, the car... You know, you've got the the Gallimimus herd, you've got the giant door, you've got all these little visual cues that remind you of the first film, and it's just, mm. there's too much of it, and, and it's at the point where I'm, I remember the first time I saw it, I think I've only seen it twice, but I remember the first time I saw it, I was sitting there, and I was thinking to myself, I would, I wish I was watching Jurassic Park right now. Yeah, yeah well, yeah, well, because that, that's one of, one, of the, one of the problems um, with cons- constantly... Referencing some, some something else, yeah, because, uh, because all, all, all you're doing is drawing attention to the fact that that what you're watching is not this other film. <laughs> yeah, yes, and and this uh, and, and also also did this uh, as some uh, other film, which is uh, one of the one of the most revered films in history. Yeah, and the thing is, Jurassic World had all this potential for me. I, I really wanted to see raptors attacking people in the line for Burger King. Or things like that, you know, a Triceratops crashing through a Starbucks. You know, they could have really leaned into the, the, a theme park that's in full operation where the, the attractions escape and just start wreaking havoc. And they just don't do that at all. Instead, you have this stupid plot about a, a dinosaur that they've created by splicing together some of the worst things in, in nature, or some of the most <laughs> dangerous things in nature, and thinking it's a good idea. 
Yeah, we, did, we didn't quite learn from the first time where we accidentally put the, the gender-changing frogs in there, so we'll now put in the camouflaging from one creature and, of course, let's put in a bit of raptor there because who doesn't want an even bigger raptor? Yeah, who, who doesn't want a giant intelligent thing that can turn invisible? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, uh, yeah uh, and then after after we've done that, then we, we and we we will give it uh, give, we'll, we'll give it the single stupidest name we can think of. Yeah, oh God, the Dominus Rex. Yeah, and a lot of people comment on the the fact that Bryce Dallas Howard is very much a a stereotype, and Chris Pratt is there as a kind of manly stereotype, and I can see why a lot of women would be offended by the Bryce Dallas Howard character, but like speaking as a man, Chris Pratt's character offends me <laughs> the fact that anybody you know, the fact that it's perceived that that's kind of a manly thing, a manly person to be, something to aspire to is, that that offends me. I have always been irritated by, by the implication that uh, yeah, that, 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 that if you're if you're just if you're that if you're just charming enough, then then you then you, you, you can then you can get get away with just be, being a be, uh, be, being a really bad person. Yeah, and that's I mean that scene where they're talking as he's working on his bike because that's what manly people do, you know, and that's yeah, it's just horrible. Although someone suggested to me, I forget who it was, but someone suggested to me that. Uh, an earlier version of the script must have had them be the adult versions of Lex and Tim. Because there is a little bit of that dynamic to them at some points in the film. It would also make sense for that to be them, really. It would make sense for them to be involved in some shape or form. You know, or or be related and so you know, I, I yeah, I definitely see that could have been written in there somewhere. Although I quite like it that um, the people have suggested that uh, Chris Pratt's character, I can't even remember his name, that's how forgettable he is, um, is the adult version of the, the fat kid that gets terrified by Alan in the first film. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's, he's so traumatised by, by, by the prospect of, um, of, of being, being hunted and killed by, by, by a raptor that he learns how to tame them. Exactly. There's your motivation there. It gives him more depth than he gets in the film. <laughs> yeah. uh, what about the other sequels? Do you have any opinions on them that you can remember? Have you seen them recently enough? Or? I've only seen each of them once, uh, quite a few years ago, so I can only remember fragments of them. One bit I do remember uh, quite liking from The Lost World was the cage with, with, with the pteranodons, or the pterodactyls, or the, the flying ones, basically. That's the uh, one. Is it? Oh. <laughs> just because, just uh, because the flying dinosaurs what 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 wasn't wasn't something which had which had been been really explored, you know, and and thought that inclusion uh, getting a, a, a new dimension like of um, of what they could do with them. And the third one also had the the ringtone that, that uh, signified the Spinosaurus' arrival. I was too young to see the first one at the cinema, uh, but I do remember going to see the second and the third. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed them, but they're not they're not films that I go back to with the same nostalgia that I go back to the first one. I wouldn't in a lineup. I wouldn't choose them. Um, they are they're okay, but like you say, there's a lot of them that are not they're not particularly memorable. Um, you know, you can easily get sort of muddled up between the two. To be honest. Um, as clearly, as Andrew just did, <laughs> you can easily, you know, kind of bits from them blending together. So yeah, I, they're okay. They're not the worst in the world. They're not the best in the world. They're all right, but it they have a lot to live up to. They're following on from a film which is just you know so good yeah. that you the think s- well. The second one has a has Vince Vaughn in it. I thought, like, thought, thought that was the third one. No, no, second one. Oh. <laughs> uh, Goldblum <laughs> with, with rises his role in the second one, which makes it better by comparison, you know, to um, to what it otherwise could be. There's he has some great lines in it, such as when um, when they're shouting for his girlfriend, they're just shouting Sarah, and then I think it's Vince Vaughn's character shouts Sarah Harding, and he says, "How many Sarahs do you think are on this island?" 
It's just the sarcastic delivery of it. It's brilliant. He has some other lines as well, but I can't remember what they were. Oh, oh which was the one that that had Pete Bustlethwaite as, as like as like like a Great White Hunter character? Uh, I believe that's the second one. Yep. So. Um, his speech about uh, wanting to hunt a T Rex is like one of the few fragments of it I it's the remember. Definitely the second one. Yeah. Yeah. He he was he didn't want his fee. He just wanted to hunt a male T Rex. Yeah. Don't know why. Because he's crazy, I guess. He's hunted yeah. everything else. So let's go for the T Rex. Yeah. No, but I think um, I think the Lost World is worth a watch. At least until the last third of it. Uh, it's weird because the first, the first two thirds of it are actually very good. Uh, where they are on the island and you see different things. I mean, the, having the two T Rexes and that, um, the trailer hanging off the cliff and stuff is just super tense stuff. Uh, I love that. I love that scene. It's, it's really well done. Uh, obviously, Spielberg's directing, so there's a lot of nice, pretty visuals in it. John Williams is, I think, still scoring it, or at least they're reusing his music. Uh, but yeah, the third one is like it could almost be a film from another franchise because it it's so f- barely connected to it. It does have that bit where uh, where Alan's dreaming, and uh, he sees the Velociraptor saying his name, which is really funny. Surely you remember that bit, no? You think, that, but that. but no, actually, no. It's it's been badly memed over the years. He's just like he's dozed off on the plane, and his friend Billy or whatever his name is says uh, Alan to wake him up but he sees a velociraptor and then hears the velociraptor <laughs> saying Alan and th- that's the film where they discover that velociraptors can speak to each other as a you know through um, forensics on the fossils and then suddenly they can speak to each other on the island as well so imagine that you couldn't do that before oh yeah yeah and uh, doesn't, that, doesn't that culminate it like in, in them Kind of pretending to be velociraptors, kind of like by, by blowing through this bone to create the same kind of sound that they talk yeah. to each other with. Yeah, which is like, which is the plan they dismiss in Star Trek Four because they would be speaking <laughs> gibberish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why the raptors stopped. They're like, "What is he saying?" <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, this guy is clearly insane. We'll just yeah. back away slowly. Yeah, yeah, I'm kind of afraid now. I'm going to leave. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I put in the notes about video games. Did you ever play any Jurassic Park themed video games? There were quite a few of them. I did I, not. I cannot contribute. That's good, yeah. I, I had a really, really early one, and I can't remember what it's called. It was one that my dad had where it was shot from top down, so it sort of looked a bit like uh, Grand Theft Auto, styly. Oh. And you were abandoned in the park, and you had to find your way out. So you started off at a little bunker. And then you had to work your way around this map to get out. I I can't remember what it was called, though. I don't know about that one. I'll try and find it, though. Do you know what it was on? Uh, PC. I'll try and find find out, but it's very old. (laughs) All right, yeah. Uh, I had quite a few of them. I had an old one on the PlayStation, the Lost World one, where you played as, like, a compy. Uh, Those levels really sucked, and I couldn't actually get through the game until I got cheats (laughs) and was able to unlock some of the later levels. So um, you could play as a compy, a velociraptor, a guy, and a T-Rex. And the T-Rex isn't as invincible as you think it is. But, um, because it's a video game, funnily enough. But it was quite fun. It was a side-scrolling type thing. It was a good laugh. Um, There's one that I never played, and I can't remember the actual title of it, but it was just... I'm sure you must have seen things on websites like Crack.com about it and things like that. It's about... Basically, you're, you're someone who's on the island, and it's... Like, it's a first-person view, and you look down at this woman's cleavage because you see a heart tattoo that gives you the, uh, the health <laughs> bar. And it's a dude with, like, the... You know, you control the arms, and you have to control them precisely so they lift stuff, but they haven't, like... They haven't got realistic physics, so you see the arms flailing all over the place. I don't know if that rings a bell to anybody. It begins with an O, like Outlast or Outland or something like that. Some I don't know, I'll put it in the show notes, but I, I remember seeing bits and pieces about it. But my favourite... Other than the arcade game, which was absolutely amazing. Where you you know, it was an on rail shooter. It was good fun. Uh, there's one that I had called Jurassic Park Operation Genesis on the PC. And it's basically you got to build your own Jurassic Park. You know, and it's one of those it takes forever to research the cool dinosaurs. But once you do, just 
just sit and watch the park go into a state of disrepair. And well, do you know, it's, it's funny you mention that, because there's a company called uh, Frontier who um, do uh, computer games, so like Elite Dangerous is their big uh, title that they've got, and they are making a new Jurassic Park game, which is exactly that, you create yeah. your own uh, park. Yeah, I saw that, it's out on the PS4 and Xbox One and all them. Mm. Um, yeah, I might get that, actually. Good company, uh, Frontier, and it, it looks interesting, actually. It yeah. looks like they've, they've spent a lot, a lot of time, and I have found uh, the Jurassic Park game. It was simply called Jurassic Park, right. and it was on DOS, okay. Microsoft DOS. This is how long ago, and it was from oh. 1993. It was also available on the Amiga. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that, that would be one that my dad bought and introduced me to, but the publisher was Ocean of America, Inc., and I think there's several <laughs> emulators available for it now. <laughs> but well, there, 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 there you go. <laughs> oh, the, the, the game that I um, was talking about was called Trespasser. And I found that out by typing in Jurassic Park Cleavage Game. And <laughs> 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 Never let it be said that my Google game is not on point. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't mess with my recommendations on anything. Yeah, uh, so video games. Uh, that Operation Genesis was good fun. Like I said, uh, I took great pride in building my park up to be an efficient um, money-making machine until such times as I had all the dinosaurs I wanted and could just watch it fall apart. Because it could be quite fun. It's a bit like in um, Roller Coaster Tycoon, you know where one of your roller coasters routinely kills people and they don't, like, the other guests don't seem to notice. So what you have is you have, like, people walking about and they're looking at the Triceratops and they're like, that's pretty cool, whatever, you know. And then they just, like, turn the corner and the T-Rex is just wandering around. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> it's just, um, I love it when AI is that dumb. Chaos again. That's what, that's yeah. what it's all about. That's chaos theory. That's chaos theory. Yeah, so, very quickly, there is another film that's due out in a couple of days. I'm just going to say I think it looks crap. I think it looks terrible. Um, I'm not... I don't know, I was hoping it might be quite good because it couldn't be much worse than World, to be honest, but at least in terms of this franchise. But it's, it looks so bizarre and not in a good way. I don't know. See, the thing is, it's, it's like, what do you do that's not already been done and do you just revisit the same stories that you've already done but in a newer... Like, we can do it with new CGI kind of thing. So I, I don't, I don't know. I'm I'm not holding out too much hope for it. Actually, it looks a little bit disappointing. None of the trailers have particularly egged me on too much. I'm feeling pretty much pretty much the same. Yeah, yeah, because from what we've seen in the trailers, it just look, looks to be large, largely a retread of things that we've seen before. But with volcanoes. True. <laughs> yes, we have a film of uh, as of. You know, where, where our core concept is that uh, dinosaurs running around eating people, and how, how, how do we make that bigger? We blow things up. We isn't blow the entire island. Isn't that only the first half of the film, or something like that? Like, the, there's this other bit about raptors on London rooftops and all this nonsense. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, well, the, well the, 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 there was like a one one shot on it uh, um, of of an evil looking and sounding guy uh, uh, comment, commenting uh, commenting about uh, uh, about raptors being a, 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 able able to be able to be trained because that worked uh, so yeah. well last time exactly yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah which, which is probably probably was meaning about uh, about about just, re, just retreading previous previous ideas yeah 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 but it see yeah but. The implication seems to be that 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 will be a core plotline of the film. Yeah, um, and uh, and and also we're uh, bring, bringing 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 about bringing about the gold bloom to to uh, to wax philosophical on pretty much everything that he did in the original original film, as of uh, of the nature of force they they can't they can't be controlled or contained. Here's my theory on that Goldblum scene that you've seen in the trailer. I think that's the final scene of the film, and that's the only scene in which he appears. 
good theory. I, th- I think it is the only scene that he appears. I don't think we're going to see him in any other scenes because I think if they had, they would have showed him in the trailer by now. Yeah, uh, more than that. I think that it does seem to be somewhat wrapping up, doesn't it? Because it's some kind of he's standing in a courtroom, and he's saying stuff about you know um, life finding a way and things. So I do think it could be the last shot of the film or the last scene in the film. Isn't isn't there some um, un- unwritten rules like for 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 people for people who make trailers like that they that they that they shouldn't um, in- include include things from 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 like the the third act of, act of a film. Yeah, but they routinely break that rule. The Amazing Spider-Man two trailer showing the final shot of the film. Yeah, so in in I in I am aware of that and it does it does annoy me. But I uh, so sometimes I try I try to rein in my natural inherent cynicism and give people the benefit of the doubt. Even Infinity War shows like one of the last shots of the film in one of the trailers. It depends on how smartly you deploy it. If you make it very obvious that it's a last act, I mean, the only problem is that when you're then sitting there watching the film, you can go, oh, I've not seen that scene from the trailer yet. Uh, that means that That's character's that still alive. That, that character survives through this. You know, It's almost impossible to view trailers without sort of spoiling bits. Though, granted, they have been quite smart now with using bits of CGI trickery to sort of change the background to certain shots and change what the characters are wearing or what's happening to them. That's what um, the clever people like Marvel that do that though. I don't think yeah, the people making a, Jurassic a few, World There's a few clever. others that do it. Jurassic World yeah, it, it doesn't look like they've been too, too familiar with it. It's it's what you do with it once, you, once you've built the park. So they, they did, okay we've built the park the park has been operating for a number of years, okay the park has now fallen to pieces. So it's like where, where do you go and they set up bits, they set up a lot of the in-gen stuff again with uh, the military wanting to get a hold of the dinosaurs, so they're just going to follow that through. But yeah, they might do something interesting with it, though. You never, you never know. Yeah. You it never know. Like were, it sounds like they were lucky that the park almost went in a meltdown, on, or almost lucky that the park went, went in a meltdown because the volcano was mere years from erupting, apparently, yeah. <laughs> destroying the entire island. It's like, oh, thank God. Like, good job we didn't have guests in. <laughs> of course, by the time that this podcast is published, the film might be out. And we'll find out if my theory about it being the last shot of the film is right. So we'll see. And we'll, we can talk about it next time on a podcast whether I was right or not. I don't think that we'll do a podcast on that film, though. I mean, we might. I don't know. Uh, it depends how much of an impression it makes. I feel like I won't have wherewithal to talk about it for very long though. Yeah, I mean, I can't really see it being a particularly enthralling podcast if uh, when you just have, have people saying variations of meh for an hour and a half. That could be a solo podcast. <laughs> you, you've heard many of our podcasts then, Andrew. <laughs> there's, there's very often I come in after a film and go, eh, it wasn't the worst, it wasn't the best. <laughs> it was a that's film. Where, that's where me as the host comes in. I'm supposed to rile everyone up and make everyone passionate. Whether I do or not is up to the, the listener <laughs> to decide. So on that, I think uh, we should wrap up. We've talked about the film, we've talked about how much we love it, we've talked about the franchise, the enduring stuff, the, the enduring iconography that, that is left in its wake. Um, I will f- ask a final question, though, because apparently it's not something you get asked as an adult. So, <laughs> Andrew, what is your favourite dinosaur? Oh, uh, mine is the Stegosaurus. Uh, it's just, uh, it, yeah, because, uh, because how can you not love a a huge lumbering lizard with giant spikes on its back? <laughs> Excellent choice, Chris. What's your favourite dinosaur? I think I'm going to have to go for an obvious one and go Triceratops. We're getting our Power Rangers team together. It seems there was no Stegosaurus, but there could have been. Uh, why Triceratops? They're cool. Valid, big horns and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to go a bit left field, and I'm going to say Allosaurus, because it's like a T-Rex, but it doesn't have all the hype. You know, it's <laughs> it's a giant carnivorous lizard, and no one really bothers about it. So I'm giving oh, Allosaurus. 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 <laughs> Allosaurus. All right, I've just seen a picture of an Allosaurus. All right, okay. <laughs> It can run up to 55 kilometres per hour, according to estimates. According to the estimates of those static skeletons that they've looked That's at. That's it. According to the skeleton, it can run 
I mean, don't get me wrong, the skeleton doesn't move that fast now. Um, but Unless it's in a car that's travelling at 55 miles an hour. And, <laughs> and I like this. It, it ate uh, stere- uh, stegosauruses and brachiosauruses, apparently. Sauruses. There we go. Allosaurus, not to be messed with. So that would be an interesting Power Rangers team where I call on the power of an Allosaurus. That would be my Zord. So in that uh, Dino Bond shell, it is time to end. So, Andrew, thank you for joining for a second time and not being put off by being on once. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm, I shall now take a helicopter back to my private island Yes, and seriously, seriously contemplate whether else I want to return. Executive bathroom island. Family Guy reference. Uh, Chris, thank you for appearing once again to talk about this masterpiece of cinema. No problem. I have uh, decided not to endorse your podcast. <laughs> you sound just like Ryan Reynolds. That was our discussion on Jurassic Park. A big thanks to YouTuber Rock Guitar 7 x for the supplied music. If you like what you heard, then please do hit that subscribe button on iTunes, YouTube, or any major podcasting app. iTunes users, we would love it if you'd leave a star rating on the show to show us some love. If you have any feedback on our new Neil Before Rise Against feature, or anything else we have to say, then you can contact us directly on Facebook or Twitter under Neil Before Blog, or leave a comment on neilbeforeblog.co.uk. As always, we hope you'll join us on the next Neil Before Pod. <laughs>